Good morning guys. Long time no see on the vlog side of this channel. It's February, February 1st. Um, I have been MIA for a reason. The month of January, I was on my trauma surgery rotation. Whew, it was a month, <laughs> but I'll get back into that later. But it's February, I'm back in the ER, you know, the place that I love to be, back to a regular schedule, semi-regular, um, a more conducive schedule um, to my lifestyle. <laughs> but back in the ED this month, uh, trauma is over. I'm so thankful I'm done with trauma forever. We do one month of trauma during our first year, one during our second year. Um, I have the day off today and then I work four days this week. And then next week I have a week off um, for vacation. I'm just doing a staycation. I'm going back home to Atlanta for the week for some much needed rest. Uh, but yeah, today I'm just going to go to the gym, um, meal prep for the week, and just chill um, and get ready for the start of the new week back in the ED this month. Let's talk about trauma. If you hear some beeping in the background, it's because my alarm battery needs to be changed. But throughout residency, um, there are a few, you know, tougher rotations. Let me just speak about emergency medicine in my program in particular. There's a few tougher rotations we rotate outside of the emergency department. Like we have a few ICU months. We have two medical ICU months. We have a cardiovascular ICU months. We had a pediatric ICU months. Those are some of the tougher ones. And we also have two months of trauma, which are the most grueling, essentially. We do one during first year, one during second year. And I just finished the one during second year, so I'm completely done, which is just such a great feeling. But the reason it's so tough is because you work six days a week, you have some 24 hour calls. Um, as an intern, you're doing a lot of floor work. So you're managing like 15 patients at a time. As a second year, it is a bit better. You're now the consultant, so you don't manage any floor patients. You see all the consults that come through the emergency department, which can at times be um, a lot as well. And then the hours every day starts at 5.30 a.m. You get off at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. doesn't sound late, but it's a long day. And then you're back the next day to do it all over again. Again, you work like six days a week. Thankfully for my month, I did luck out. <laughs> um, I, there's typically just one junior on a month, and that is the second year resident who sees all the consults. Um, this month there was two. So there was me, and there was this surgery uh, junior. So we got to split the consults. Um, so for example, if there was like eight consults that day, I only saw four. Um, and then as well as the 24 hour shifts, because there were two of us, I only had to do one 24 hour shift a month while, you know, sometimes some of the other, uh, some of my co-residents had to do three or two. So fortunately I lucked out um, having another uh, junior resident on during my month. So the team is made up of a chief resident. This chief can be the ICU fellow, or generally it is um, maybe like the fifth year general surgery resident. This month it was a fellow for us. We have about maybe four to five interns on, and then we have one junior, but this month it was two juniors. So we had a pretty full team. Um, so whenever a trauma alert comes through, it's paged over the intercom, like level one trauma alert, level two trauma alert. We all go down to the trauma bay and um, we run the trauma alert. And then kind of dispo that patient. Um, the list is very, very long. We have so many patients um, on our service, so it can get quite busy. Um, my job as the junior resident, as a, um, the consultant for the month, whenever a trauma came through through the emergency department and that patient either needed to be admitted or just evaluated by trauma, I was the one that had to go see them. So do the whole history and physical, assess if any further imaging was needed, um, admit them if they need to be admitted 
um, contact all the consultants. So for example, say a patient came in um, via uh, EMS uh, after a car accident. They come to the emergency department, the emergency providers, they work them up and they may discover that they have a um, dislocated hip or a fractured hip. They will then control, consult the trauma team. My attending would then let me know there's a consult to go see in the emergency department. I will evaluate this patient. I will look all the, at all the images. If anything was missing as far as further imaging, I would go ahead and order that. But if I determine, okay, they have a fractured bone, I go ahead and consult ortho and then I admit them to our service. Um, I put in all the admission orders. I um, med rec them. So I go through all of their home medications, um, restart all of the appropriate home medications. Obviously, you're not going to restart any blood thinners while in the hospital. You're going to hold certain medications like lisinopril if they're going to have surgery tomorrow. Medrec at times became a bit frustrating because these patients often don't know their medicine. You can't just say, oh, you don't know it. That's fine. Like you have to figure out how to get their med list. Either that's calling the family members, calling their pharmacy that they go to, which is what I did a lot. I had to call their pharmacy and confirm all the meds that they um, that they are on. So Medrec is so important. Um, contacting the consultants, whether that's orthopedics, neurosurgery, um, who was a common one? ENT, phase. Um, ortho was probably the most common one uh, that we consulted, consulted as well as neurosurgery. So that was my role essentially. The one day that I had the 24 hour call, oh, I was absolutely crushed. Like I had eight consults that night. There was five trauma alerts that came in. Um, my attending was super helpful though. He was around like the whole night. I felt like I was so busy that I didn't even have time to feel tired. Like I wasn't even tired of sleep because I was just moving the entire night. I was just on go, go the entire night. So that was my one 24 hour call shift. Um, I wanted an only a residency. I don't ever have to do another 24 hour call shift again. And that is big for a lot of people, you know, like when they're applying to residency programs and really like vetting out like what is your schedule, what is your call shift, like how many 24 hours do you do? For example, um, I know one of my med school classmates, um, her program in particular, she's in internal medicine. Um, they don't do any 24 hour call shifts as opposed to maybe some other internal medicine. When you're inpatient, you can take call every three days, every four days, and that is very grueling. Like that is taxing on the body. So that's something important. Like you may think it's, oh, it's kind of picky to like think about the particular schedules of your residency program, but that's really important. Like throughout your three plus years of residency, like what kind of call shifts are you gonna have? Are you gonna have to do 24, really 28 hour call shifts? Um, so it's important to ask those questions. But I think the main thing about this month, not only the physical fatigue from working so much, but just the mental fatigue, like knowing, oh my gosh, like I have to come back tomorrow, deal with this full list, wake up in the morning, do it all over again. And the day starts so early, 5.30 a.m. Like I would literally, every night, I would go to sleep between eight and nine o'clock. Um, and that gave me about maybe eight plus hours of sleep. So I was getting good sleep because I made sure I, I went to sleep early. So I was waking up, you know, feeling good and refreshed, but still like the days are long and exhausting. Um, but yes, thank God I am done forever with trauma. Um, on to the next, I'm back in the ED this month and I'm in the ED until May. Um, I do do a PEDS EM month in Orlando, but ED until until May when I do another ICU month, that's um, cardiovascular ICU. And I think what, four or five months left of second year that I'm starting my final year in July. So January flew by. Um, it really, I thought it was going to be drag out, but it, it really flew by. It was just a busy, busy month. Um, now, February is a shorter month, and I'm on to the next. My body has definitely shifted, and I'm, like, naturally waking up between 7 and 8 o'clock, um, even when I don't have to work. But that is okay, because for the next few shifts in the ED anyways, I'm working a 7 a.m. shift, the 7 to 4 p.m. shift. Um, but it's 10 o'clock now already getting the day started and I'm going to start with a morning workout so I'm going to get ready to head to the gym. I am finished with my workout. I'm stopping into Publix really quick to get some spinach and some frozen fruit to make some smoothies. 
get my frozen food from Publix and I don't have a mix that I really like. Like I don't want grapes or peaches. I also just don't want a mango. I think I'm gonna go with the mango chunks. Alright, I'm back. I've showered, getting ready to make a smoothie. If you guys have been following me since my med school days, you know I love my green smoothies. I used to make them maybe like three or four times a week. Um, but I keep it really simple. Um, spinach, banana, um, either almond butter, peanut butter, some kind of mixed fruit, and then um, some almond milk. I'm actually out of almond milk. Then I usually do protein powder. Um, go with a simple one, organic vanilla. This is Stanley's right there. Um, so yeah, that is about it. Also, Greek yogurt. Forgot I'm missing that as well. It's a few hours later, but I have some lunch. Having a gyro or gyro of beef one, um, some tzatziki sauce, pita, some greens, onions, um, tomatoes. I had made it yesterday, just having some leftovers today, and it's pretty good. Good morning, guys. It is Wednesday, and I'm back. It's Wednesday and I am back at it. First day back in the ER since November. So hoping for a good shift today. It is 6.32. Um, my shift starts at 7, 7 to 4 p.m. Um, I think I'm just gonna eat breakfast at the hospital. This is not it's not really in the garden anyone who's lined up outside in the day. Busy, busy day. Can y'all see how tired I look in my eyes? Busy day. Great shift though. Man, saw a lot of patients. At least 60% of my patients were COVID positive. It's definitely still out here, but I think the peak and down trend is supposed to happen sometime this month. So hopefully the numbers start going down soon. Good morning guys, uh, no, good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock, uh, it's Thursday. Thursday are our conference day, so we had conference this morning. It's via Zoom again because of the increase in the COVID numbers. Um, so it was from eight to 12. I do work today, I have a shift from one to 10 p.m. Um, I actually prefer to work on Thursdays conference days because if you end up having Thursday off, you still have to end up getting up anyways early at 8 a.m. and going to conference. So to me, it's best just to work on that day and then you have a shortened shift because typically this shift would have been from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. But because we have conference, all shifts start at 1 p.m. Um, so yeah, I have to be at work in about an hour. Um, I'm just gonna make some lunch and then head out soon. Hey guys, so it is actually the next day, two shifts later, I ended up having that shift yesterday afternoon and got off really late, I ended up getting home around 10.30 and the next morning, which was today, I had another shift at 7 a.m. Um, so 7 a.m. to 4 today. Today was a pretty good day, it wasn't too busy, got out on time. Um, it's Friday, I have another shift um, tomorrow morning and then Tomorrow night, I have a flight out to Atlanta. I have a vacation week um, coming up, but I'm just gonna stay home for the week. I have nine days off, I'm just gonna rest. Just need some rest after this long month of trauma. Um, it's just been 
an exhausting month of January. So it'll be nice to just chill out um, and have a week off. But I'm going to clean the house, um, pack, and then I have one more shift tomorrow. Shift four out of four is done. I'm just getting home, having a snack. Um, hummus with these pita crackers right here are so good. New favorite combo. Um, let me grab the tripod real quick. Okay, so before I mentioned that I would be doing like um, an emergency medicine topic um, every vlog. And so today I'm gonna talk about sepsis. And sepsis is like a severe um, form of infection when your body is just having an overall bad response to infection. All right, so sepsis is something that we commonly see and treat in the emergency department. And it's so important that you diagnose this early on and start treatment early because um, untreated sepsis is associated with a high mortality rate. So when a patient is coming in and you're and you think they have some kind of infection um, or could be septic or really sick from some kind of infection, the first things you're gonna look at is their vital signs. Now, the first part of sepsis is, are they SIRS positive? So SIRS is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Let me just double check that. Right, <laughs> um, so that's what SIRS is. And so um, to be SIRS positive, you need two of, I think it's four criteria. So it's either an elevated heart rate above 90, an elevated respiratory rate above 20, an elevated temperature above 100.9, or an, an elevated white count, which is I think greater than 12 or on the lower side, so like less than four or three point something. So if you have two of those, plus you suspect a source of infection, then you are SIRS positive. And then you move on to the next thing. If they are SIRS positive, it's important within that first hour to give them their IV fluids and give them their antibiotics. And so antibiotics, if you are not exactly sure what you're treating, um, you can tailor it and make it really broad, like vancomycin and zosin. Um, those are kind of like the big go-tos for broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, if you have an a source of infection, maybe pulmonary, then you can tailor, tailor it a bit more. Um, at my hospital, the go-to was kind of like um, unison and doxycycline, some other places it may be rocephin and um, and doxycycline. Um, if you think it's a urinary source, you could go to either rocephin or um, cefepime. So that's the big thing. You see the patient, you evaluate them, you notice, hmm, their vitals are off, and I suspect a source of infection. Just because you have a high um, heart rate and respiratory rate does not mean you're septic. You could have literally maybe just rant or something, and that's why you know you're tachycardic and um, and to kipnik so you have to have that source of infection to now lead you down that sepsis pathway so SIRS positive you have your source of infection you have your IV fluids on board you have your antibiotics on board the next thing you need to do before you um, administer antibiotics draw those blood cultures and um, also get a lactic acid um, and the lactic acid is important because then you kind of um, categorize what level of obsessives is this is it like septic shock which is a lactic acid above um, four or um, I think it'll be severe sepsis if the lactic acid is two or greater. Um, and then it's important to categorize that because if they're in septic shock, the amount of fluids they have to get is 30 cc's per kg. You have to make sure you fluid resuscitate them properly. Okay, so back to the beginning. You see this patient, they're SIRS pos positive based on those vital signs or the white count. Um, you have your source of infection, your sus suspected source of infection. You need to give them IV fluids, antibiotics, make sure you uh, draw those blood cultures and make sure you get that lactic acid as well. And then um, from there, get the rest of the lab work, start the full workup, whatever they need, whether that's a chest x-ray, a urine analysis, um, basic blood work. Um, and then from there, the main thing is fluid resuscitation. If they need um, vasopressor support, maybe because they're hypotensive, you can throw on maybe some um, some levofed. But the big thing is to identify it early on, start those antibiotics early and start those fluids early. One thing that I've also learned is um, not to be hesitant to start um, vasopressors early on. So vasopressors, um, they kind of give you like that peripheral vascular constriction. Like if your patient is hypotensive, then a vasopressor would be what you would go to to help their blood pressure increase. 
um, oftentimes, you know, people may wait until they give two liters or three liters and the patient is still not responding and they're hypotensive and then they'll go to vasopressors. But when you think about it, your patient is not perfusing. Then two, three hours later, you finally put vasopressors on. I mean, that can cause a lot of end organ damage if you're not giving, um, you know, oxygenated blood to the heart, to the kidneys, to the brain. So you can start vasopressors early on while you're also starting the fluid resuscitation and often um and also it's important to let your nurses know you can do a vasopressor through a peripheral iv you don't have to place a central line immediately um you can do peripheral um have it going peripherally for up to 24 hours and just because they start on vasopressors early doesn't mean they have to be on it for a long time by the end of the shift or a couple hours later they can potentially be off of the vasopressor you can you know down down titrate it as you go so that's one big one you don't have to wait until you're two three liters in before you start that basal uh, vasopressor support if they're hypertensive you can put it on early and they can respond better that way so that is my little teaching point on sepsis um that is so common to see septic patients in the emergency department it's definitely something you need to know how to recognize early on and how to treat um yeah so that is my teaching point if you guys have any other suggestion for topics that you're interested about um regarding emergency medicine management just leave it below but it is five o'clock my flight is around eight o'clock i did um some packing yesterday so i'm pretty much done with my packing so yeah i have the next nine days off so ready to get some rest um and to be back home in atlanta if you guys enjoyed this video make sure to give it a thumbs up make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and i'll see you guys next week bye